So there are three great families of faith that trace their spiritual heritage uh, back, to, back to Abraham. You might diagram it this way. There's Abraham, and then Judaism uh, claims Abraham as the father of the Jewish faith, and so does Christianity. So Christianity looks to Abraham as the father of our faith, um, and uh, likewise, Judaism has had a significant influence upon, upon Christianity. And then there's Islam, and Islam sees Abraham as very significant in the formation of their faith, um, as well as Judaism has been very significant in forming the Muslim self-understanding in various ways, as well as Christianity. When you read the Quran, you see these, these uh, you see Abraham, Judaism, and Christianity all in various ways reflected within the writings of the Quran, the Muslim scriptures. And so these three faiths um, uh, are, comprise what we call the Abrahamic faiths uh, around the world. And as I mentioned just a minute ago, a couple minutes ago, uh, half of the world's population would be part of these families of faith. What I'm going to do is to, in my presentation on the Christian faith, and then I want to do some work with Judaism and, and Islam as well, what I want to do is to lean on a Jewish scholar, actually, um, called Emil Fackenheim. Emil Fackenheim, uh, a Jewish scholar uh, who uh, writes prolifically, has written prolifically, and he makes a comment which I find very helpful. He says, biblical faith is root events that create an abiding astonishment root events that create an abiding astonishment. We've been talking about metanarratives. These metanarratives are grounded in historical events. We talked about the Bhagavad Gita earlier on. Whether, the Bhag whether Krishna and Arjuna ever actually went into a war against cousins uh, is an irrelevant question. The purpose of the Bhagavad Gita is a philosophical instruction, and the story is used to instruct philosophically. Whether it happened historically or not doesn't matter. Within biblical faith, the root events uh, are grounded in, in historical action by God, God acting in history. And this is why, as we mentioned earlier, the Bible is the only scripture in the world that is preeminently history. Um, I was reading the scriptures again this morning before I came to this class, reading the story of uh, Peter and Cornelius in the book of Acts. Very fascinating story. It's, 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 it's an account, a historical account, an account of a historical event that took place when Peter went to meet with Cornelius. And that is the nature of biblical revelation. It is an ongoing narrative about I think scholars say about 80% of the Bible in various ways is historical narrative, you see. So Emil picks up on this, Emil Fackenheim, and says, biblical faith is root events that create an abiding astonishment. And that abiding astonishment is carried on generation to generation through uh, uh, simple rituals. For example, within the Christian movement, the regular participation in the communion service, where the bread and the cup are taken, the cup of wine and the bread, who, which are symbolical of the body of Christ uh, and his, and his um, shed blood on the cross. The cross is very central to the Christian faith. And that regular, very repeated practice of, re, of, of uh, recovering again and again the abiding astonishment of that event, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Or within Judaism, certainly the Passover is such an event where over and over again, every year, the Jewish people reenact in various ways that event, remembering what happened, a root event that creates an abiding astonishment. And so having said that, what is God up to in these root events, these root events? What's he doing? Why is he acting in history in this way? Why these narratives about the action of God among us? What does God want to happen? 
And as one walks through the Bible, it's very clear what God's intention is. His intention is to form a covenant people who will honor him and serve him in his kingdom now and eternally. So God is at work calling forth the people and forming them to be his covenant people to serve around the world, extending the blessings of God to all, to all creation and to all humanity. So it's, it's not just God acting because he enjoys acting. God is acting with a purpose. He is acting in order to call forth faith and to form those who respond in faith into a community of people who serve him generously and enthusiastically. So now let's just look uh, rather briefly at a number of these root events uh, which are so significant within biblical faith. The first and most obvious is in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis chapter 1. Some time ago I was flying from Budapest to, uh, from, from Bucharest to Moscow and my seatmate was from China, about a 25-year-old Chinese businessman. And I introduced myself over the lunchtime as uh, David Shank, a Christian. Wow, he says, I never met a Christian before. Uh, I would like to hear what you believe. He says, in our universities in China, we're informed that Christianity is not a very intelligent religion, but uh, you seem like you do sort of understand what you're saying. So could you please tell me what you believe? And so what do you think I did? Well, I turned to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this Chinese businessman said, wow, <laughs> wow. <laughs> and what we did is just what I'm doing in class now. I just walked through the Bible and shared a number of these root events, God acting in history to bring about the formation of a covenant people. And he would keep saying, wow, wow. But the first root event, the first root event must be creation. And it's God who creates. It's a creation by God. And so God is not one with creation. He is other than. Uh, the creation does not happen in chaos. Like the, like the uh, Marduk, Tiamat uh, myth describes. Chaos and war and violence and so forth. There's nothing like that in the biblical account at all. God speaks and it is created. Orderly, understandable, simple, forthright. God speaks and the creation happens. Creation is his self-expression, his, uh, his, uh, his decision, his action. He brings it about. The second, uh, and these are, like I say, these are not all the root events in the Bible by any means. I'm just looking at a few key events which I think are very important in understanding biblical faith. Uh, number two, the turning away from God, creating sinfulness and alienation. Um, I don't like to include that as a root event, the turning away from God. But it is a root event. It is at the dawn of human history that Adam and Eve, the parents of us all, turn away from God. Within the Hindu expression, we learn that sin and evil and, and wrongdoing and so forth come about through ignorance. Within biblical faith, it's, 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 it's a decision, a decision to turn away from God. That's the window through which evil and sinfulness enters our experience. And biblical faith is extremely realistic. Um, uh, it, it, it says it the way it is. If David gets involved, King David, who is a man after God's own heart, gets involved in a horrible murder, adultery scandal, why the Bible doesn't cover that up. It says it the way it is. And uh, that is amazing, that biblical scriptures are so forthright in describing the stories as they really are, not covering it up. Uh, why? Because the Bible is aware that unless we deal with the sinfulness within us and among us, why, there is no cure. That it must be dealt with, it must be repented of, it must be addressed. And uh, so, right at the dawn of human history, Adam and Eve turn away from God, they hide from God, they're alienated from one another and from God and from creation. It's a very sad and tragic story. And, uh, but in the middle of it all, God does not abandon them. He enters the garden, finds them hiding behind the bush, and he promises in the midst of that encounter that a son born to the woman will deal with evil and, uh, 
and although he'll be wounded in the battle, it says specifically, a son born to the woman will, 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 will crush the head of the serpent, but his heel will be wounded by the serpent. And the serpent refers to evil, rebellion against God, all of that sort of thing. So right in the midst of this turning away from God, God promises a Savior will come. And that promise persists through the pages of the Bible from beginning to end. This promise of salvation, God has not abandoned us. Our sinfulness may have turned us away from God. We may be in rebellion against him, but God does not leave us. He persists. He goes into the garden and says, Ho, Adam, where are you? And that ho, Adam, where are you? Has come to us down through the ages to this very day today. That's God's, that's God's commitment to us. Second one, the call of Abraham. Abraham lived in Haran, in present-day Iraq. Uh, his people worshipped many gods. Uh, in fact, the myth was prevalent that we shared earlier, the myth of Tiamat and Marduk, you know, that violent myth. It's that kind of worldview in which Abraham lived. And in the, middle, in the middle of all of that, God comes to Abraham and calls him. And he says to him, I want to read the passage actually, it's very amazing. So Abraham is living in this polytheistic world and the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and those who curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed by you. This amazing call to Abraham. Leave your people, start a journey, and this journey means that I will bless you, but you also, in turn, will become a blessing to all people. And um, that's the beginning of the Abrahamic movement. He leaves his people, as God ordered him to do. He goes into the land of Canaan, and God provides land for him by Abraham being a good neighbor. In fact, uh, eventually, the people of the land said, Abraham, you're such a good neighbor, we want you to live among us. <laughs> you know, you are really welcome. God provided land for him by Abraham being a good neighbor. And Abraham, and they said to Abraham, the, the neighbors among whom he was living, your presence here is a blessing to us. And all who follow in the faith of Abraham, that's the way in which they should follow. They should be a people of blessing. That the people around in the community and so forth say, these people who, who are participating in the Abrahamic faith are a blessing among us. We like them to stay with us for they're such a blessing to us. So God blesses Abraham, yes, but he also uses Abraham to bless the nations among which he lived. He has that mission to fulfill. And God promises Abraham that as you follow me, your progeny will be as many as the stars of the sky. <laughs> That's billions and billions, isn't it? And as many as the sand by the seashore. And I often think of that today when I said just a bit ago, half of the world's population traced their spiritual origin to Abraham. That's some 3.5 billion people on earth, you know. And God said, as many as the sand by the seaside, that's how many your progeny will be. These people who are called by God to be a blessing to the nations as they follow in Abraham's footsteps. So I'm not saying Abraham was, that he was uh, without his flaws. He did, he had his flaws. Yet God called him and Abraham said yes to that call. And so he is referred to as the father of faith. Even a small Even a country, country can make, make a big difference. difference. Jesus said 5,000 5, 5, people, people because of the little boys, boys five loaves. Regardless, Regardless of the amount, amount your contribution, your contribution is, is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at seminaristamary.com. <laughs>